A microphone on you just for the recording. Oh. We'll only have it live when uh, when we're speaking. Brilliant, thank you. Anywhere where it's kind of yeah, it's fine. Okay, thank you.
Can I ask you to move towards the center, if you can, so that there are some empty seats on the side? wait for a couple of minutes before starting. So. <laughs> no, he might be slightly stressed. That's the second inaugural lecture that I'm attending. Is that right? Well, good afternoon uh, and welcome. My name is Peter Chung. I'm head of electrical engineering uh, in, at Imperial College, at least for the next uh, remaining four months. Um, it's great pleasure for me to introduce today's inaugural lecture by Professor Pierre Luigi. He originally came from Naples in Italy. He graduated from the University in Naples in 1997. Having sampled the US culture at Stanford as a visiting scholar and undergraduate student for six months, he decided to go to EPFL for his postgraduate study. And he obtained his PhD in 2002 under the supervision of Professor Martin Vettelli, sitting over there. And Pierre Luigi was of such a high caliber that I'm pleased to say this department has the wisdom to hire him right away after his PhD graduation. So he joined us in autumn of 2002, very steadily rose from lecturer to senior lecturer, reader, and then last October became a professor in signal processing. And in case you don't know this rank, it doesn't really matter. It's just go to the top. He can't be promoted any further. <laughs> Pierre Luigi is a true scholar, as you will find out from the talk later on this evening. But much more than that, he's also a wonderful colleague. His PhD students always say to me how fortunate they are to have put Pierre Luigi as their mentor. For those of you who are sitting here looking for a, a PhD supervisor, take note of that. For those who have collaborated with him as colleagues on different projects, he is one of those colleagues that you re are really happy to be on your team. He's also an excellent teacher. His second year course on signals and linear system has always been one of the highest scoring module in the second year. And increasingly in recent years, he's also involved in the running of the department Currently, he is looking after the entire curriculum of the first year. It is therefore my greatest pleasure to invite Professor Dragotti to deliver his inaugural lecture entitled Spa Signal Processing, Occam in the Age of Abundance.
Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this uh, inaugural lecture, which is not about Star Wars. <laughs> it's about signal processing. Okay? But uh, I hope that by the end of this talk, you will all agree with me that uh, signal processing can be as exciting as science fiction. But before you know, getting there, okay, we have some mileage to do. And so let me tell you what we're trying to cover uh, today. So the first thing I'm going to do, I want to highlight two kind of general principles or guidelines that uh, we follow in modern signal processing nowadays. One is a very general idea, which is quite universal. And so it's the idea that uh, given a complicated phenomenon to analyze, we try to decompose it into elementary building blocks. And so we need to find the right building blocks. And then the other thing is we want these building blocks to be useful so that we can reconstruct that phenomenon. This is a common idea, and I'll try to give you an understanding on how we do this in signal processing. The other kind of guiding principle that we follow uh, nowadays is uh, the Occam's principle, which is the idea of parsimony. And I'll talk about parsimony later on. But we call it in a different way in the signal processing. We call it sparsity. And so everything would be about sparsity today. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to look at three different topics okay, where we use sparsity and elementary building blocks. One is the analog to digital conversion process, which we call sampling. And as you can see from the minutes here, most of the lecture will be about that. OK, so bear with me for most of, 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 of the lecture on sampling. But then I want to touch upon two other topics and show you how we tend to attack these type of topics. One is on multi-camera system, and the other is in the area of uh, social networks. OK, so let me start with this idea of elementary building blocks. As I said, this is kind of a general idea. And uh, we are all used to that. And I think the most kind of enlightening example is obviously the Lego brick. right? That's a nice building block. And we know that when we put all the Lego together, we can do something complicated like building a nice house or an incredible car and things like that. Now, in signal processing, we do exactly the same thing. We have a complicated signal XT. That would be the house, if you want. And we try to decompose it using elementary functions, phi i. These would be the bricks in the Lego analogy. And the question is, uh, what phi i are, are we going to pick? And how are we going to reconstruct the signal? Now, this problem is not new. The first person who looked at it was Fourier. And what Fourier said is, uh, if you have a signal with finite duration, or if you want a periodic signal, then the right building blocks you should consider are everlasting sine waves. And so if you pick the right frequencies, you can represent any uh, periodic signal by just combining properly these sine waves. What is probably less known is the fact that uh, a little bit after Fourier, there was this other guy, Haar, who did the same thing, but he used a different building block. He used uh, this type of function, which looks a bit more like uh, the Lego brick to some extent. And uh, what he said is, OK, if you give me this function, if I take proper shift of this function, and if I take proper rescale version of the function, so if I squeeze it and I dilate it, then if I combine all this version of this function, I can represent any signal with finite energy. So what, uh, sorry, Har didn't know at that time was that he had invented the first wavelet. Okay? Now we can do this using different type of functions. So we can use different prototype <coughs> building blocks, but uh, the structure is the same. We have a prototype function. We take proper shifted version of this function, proper, properly dilated and squeezed version of this function, and we can represent any complicated signal using this uh, uh, set of elementary functions. So based on all this construction, then the uh, first natural question is, if I'm faced with a concrete problem, OK, I have whatever, a certain signal to analyze, et cetera, which type of decomposition should I use? Should I use the Fourier series, for example, or should I use a wavelet? That's a natural question to ask, and uh, it took us a while, a while to find an answer to this question, to be honest. But I would say now it's uh, broadly accepted that the principle that we should follow is the Occam Razor principle. Okay? So Occam, for those who don't know, stands for William of Occam, who was English, by the way, so everybody should know about him. He was uh, a, 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 a friar, a Franciscan friar, and he came up with this concept. He called it uh, uh, lex uh, parsimonie, so low parsimony. The idea is that if you have a certain problem and you have two models that predict equally well, you should always pick the model which is the simplest one. So the model that requires the smallest number of <coughs> hypotheses. So if we turn this to our problem, what we're really saying is that if you have a signal 
and you have two alternative decompositions, and you can approximate the signal well, equally well with uh, these two approximations, you should uh, decomposition, you should pick the one which requires the smallest number of elements, so the smallest number of building blocks. Well, we say you should pick the decomposition that provides a sparser or a compact representation of your signal. So as I said, this idea of parsimony, we call it a sparsity. And what happens in practice is that for most natural signals, wavelengths tend to provide a sparser representation of natural signals than the Fourier series, and consequently this is why we tend to prefer the wavelength transform in many signal processing applications. Let me show you this uh, uh, with a ex simple example. So let's assume you're given an image, this is called cameraman, and then you decompose this image either using the Fourier series or using the wavelet transform, and then you reconstruct it, but you're allowed to use only 2% of your building blocks. Not all the building blocks necessary to reconstruct the signal exactly, but only a fraction, an extremely small fraction. So the wavelet transfer is able to give you a better approximation. I think you can see this visually very clearly, and this is why we think this is a better transfer. It provides a more compact description of that uh, signal. And I like to insist also on this number, you know, 2%. That gives us the feeling that this transfer, or in general, the essential information in a signal can really be gathered in an extremely small number of coefficients or of parameters. And this is one thing that I want to retain for the rest of the talk. Now there is another aspect of the wavelet transfer, which is again kind of overlooked, but is actually quite important uh, to us. So what I said is, okay, so this uh, function phi is uh, uh, this prototype function, but then also the shifted version and the rescaled versions, okay? And as I said before, what we do, we try to reconstruct X by combining these building blocks. Uh, and so what we do is we find these coefficients, alpha i, and then uh, uh, we fix the support here, we shift this function, we shift it again, and so on. And then we iterate the process by changing the scale of this function. So dilating it or squeezing it. So let me fix the scale at this stage. So let's look at how we do this for one fixed support of this function. So how do we find this coefficient for the case in which the, support, the function has this support? So what we do is uh, uh, we compute the inner product between the signal we want to decompose and our elementary function. Now an inner product in, uh, in signal processing is really a way to measure similarity, if you want, between two signals. So in some sense, I'm measuring the similarity between my signal and my prototype function. And then this gives me a value which I store, and this will be my alpha zero. And then I shift the function and I repeat the process. I compute the inner product again, and I get another value and I store it. And then I compute the inner product again, one more value, and so on and so forth. Okay? So these are the alphas I have for this scale. Then what I should do, I should change the scale, so I should squeeze this function and repeat the process. But let me stick with this scale. So if I stick at, at this level and I try to reconstruct this signal, I get a certain approximation, which I'm going to denote here with xm, which is really obtained by taking these coefficients and taking these functions and these shifted versions and combining it. Okay. And so what the wavelet theory tells me is essentially how well I am approximating this original function by just operating at this, scale, at this scale. So in some sense, the wavelet theory tells me the amount of information of x which I've transferred to these coefficients. And obviously, as I said before, if I want to reconstruct it completely, I'll need to operate also on other scales. Let me stick with this one, and so with this fact that I, I, I have a theory, if you want, to understand how much of xt has been transferred in these coefficients. Now, do we need this structure, and is this useful to us? And to convince you of the importance of this structure and of the mathematics behind this, let me introduce the first topic of the talk, which is the analog to digital conversion process. Now, this is a process that uh, probably we don't realize, but we use every day, because now every day, as soon as uh, there is a funny moment in our life, every, you know, there's something we want to remember, then we take a picture, or we take a video, or we take an audio, whatever. And uh, each time we do that, we are converting a real life signal into samples or into a digital form. And this is the analog to digital conversion process. So you have a scene here, you maybe use your mobile phone, and you take a picture, and this scene is turned into pixels. In that case, in the general case, it's turned into samples. Let me try and abstract a little bit this process. 
So what I said is we have an arbitrary signal here, okay, and then we sense this system, this uh, signal with our acquisition device. So that might be the, the digital camera. And the device introduces a distortion, that's inevitable. So we model it as if we had a filter here and uh, with a certain response, which is this one here, which model the distortion. That may model, for example, the distortion of a lens in a digital camera. And then the distorted signal is turned into the samples or into pixels, if you're thinking of the camera, and we model that with a switch. Okay? Now, based on this model, can I understand how the information from here is transferred into here? And this is when things uh, become interesting, because what happens is exactly what we saw before. So the first pixel of that image is really obtained by taking the inner product between the signal that you're trying to acquire and the distortion which is due to your camera or your general acquisition device. And so the first pixel, if you want, is given by that inner product. What happens to the second pixel? Well, that's obtained by shifting. Now, it's not the wavelet now, it's your distortion due to your acquisition device, and then taking again an inner product. And then you shift again, take another inner product, and this gives you this other pixel, and so on and so forth. So the entity, the, the uh, value of each sample depends on these inner products uh, uh, of this shifted version of, of our device. Okay? And so now, because this process is exactly the same as the one that we saw before, we can use wavelet theory to kind of understand the amount of information of the real world phenomenon which is transferred to the pixels or if you want the samples of your image. And to stress this point even more, what I'm going to do, I'm going to split these lives into three regions. So this is the continuous time, the real world. Let's say this is the realm of analog. So here is everything analog. Then when things is turned into samples, then here is where we do digital signal processing. Okay, so what we do, we look at the samples and we manipulate them in some ways. And so the bridge between these two domains is given by this distortion of the acquisition, the acquisition device, but also the wavelet theory allows us to understand how much of the analog world has been transferred into the digital world. Okay? And also gives us some intuition on how I can probably modify this process so that I can get more information. So my goal now is to improve on this analog to digital compression, uh, the, uh, conversion uh, uh, process. And my goal is to try and get more information out of less data. So I want to get less pixels, but I want to get much more quality, much more information out of it. And how am I going to achieve that? So I'm going to follow these two uh, uh, things. So first of all, I'm going to use this understanding that is provided by wavelets, and I kind of highlight that uh, later on, that allows me to have a, an understanding of how much information I can transfer when I go from analog to digital. But the other thing I want to follow is the idea of sparsity. So the idea that the essential information in a signal can be really gathered into a very small number of parameters. We saw that with an example, 2% of coefficients, we get essentially cameramen. And so now what I want to make sure is that that fraction of information, which is the essential information, is transferred into the digital form so that I can then retrieve it and reconstruct a very high quality signal using a very small number of pixels. Why am I so obsessed with this A to D conversion process? I mean, we do it every day, right? I mean, as we said, everybody has a, it's a smartphone. I bought one uh, two weeks ago. I didn't have uh, uh, any one, but I was told if you want to give an inaugural lecture, you need to have a smartphone. So I bought one. <laughs> and uh, so it works, right? We, we do analog to digital conversion every day. So let me show you a few numbers to kind of convince you that there is something wrong in the way we do that. So apparently the Hadron Collider at CERN generates 40 terabytes of data per second, and most of this data is discarded straight away. No time to analyze it. Uh, the data that we create now exceeds the available storage space. So take all your mobile phones or your tablets, computers, put all of them together, contact the entire world, contact Google, Amazon, put everything together. That's not enough to store the information that we generate. We survive just because we discard most of the information that we generate. So that's completely inefficient, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, as a consequence, there are obviously economic costs of that. First of all, you know, companies that uh, process data 
wants their own uh, power plant. Okay? They understand that they need energy and so uh, uh, they need to make sure they don't run out of energy. It's projected that in five years, the amount of energy that we in the ICT sector are going to consume is almost going to double. I don't think these numbers are acceptable, right? This is uh, a huge inefficiency. I don't think any of you is happy with the idea that we are going to pollute the world twice as much as we do now in a few years' time. So we got to do something. Okay, let's try and do something together. So to show how we try and do this, uh, uh, let's say, spark something, let me go through an example. So let's assume I'm trying to take a picture of a starry sky, okay? Or maybe I've taken a picture of a starry sky and I want to get the highest possible quality. Now, let's assume there are K stars here, okay? So if I think in an abstract way of what is the essential information here, well, it's really the location of these stars and their amplitude, okay, their intensity. Because if I can give you this information with high accuracy, everything else is not that important. And so I can get, I would say, good uh, quality of the image. However, solving this problem when we move from continuous time to uh, discrete time is not easy. And let me show you this with a kind of an example. So let's assume I've taken this picture and let me concentrate on one star. So if I zoom in, these are the pixels here. And so the idea is that I want to be able to retrieve with very high precision the location of this star using these pixels. Okay? Now what we can say for sure is that some pixels are brighter. This is where more or less the star is and some other pixels are darker. Okay? And obviously if I move the star a little bit, okay, if I move it, then some of the brighter pixels will get darker and some of the darker pixels will get brighter. And so based on that, I may try and retrieve the location of the star. Okay? So I'm going to do the following experiment now. I'm going to assume that the star here is moving only along the x-axis. Okay? So one very simple movement. And I'm going to track the value of uh, three pixels here. Okay? So I'm picking three pixels. So some will get brighter and some will get darker when I move the star. Okay, so it's only one parameter here, it's just a movement along the x-axis, but let me show you when I plot the three pixels versus this movement, what I'm going to see. Okay, so here is what I see. So the trajectory which is followed is a manifold, okay? So the connection between these single parameters and the samples is highly nonlinear, okay? It's, uh, it's not easy to find the location of the stars out of this manifold. And this is under the assumption that I'm just looking at this one star moving along one axis. If you have k stars, if you look at these all together, then the data will be on a low dimensional manifold that will be highly complicated to find this uh, uh, manifold. So how am I going to do that? And so let me stick with uh, astronomy here to give you the idea of our approach. So what we're going to do, we're going to play the role of the devil. Okay, so the devil is going to do the following. He says, oh, human beings like stars, so I'm going to switch off all the stars. So I'm going to get k black holes, and what I'm going to do, I take one black hole here, and I'm going to place exactly where a star is, so I'm kind of switching off that, slide, uh, that uh, star. And then I take another black hole, I go on another star, and I switch off that other star. And when I'm done, uh, when I, uh, I've switched off all the stars, then the sky will be dark. So I'm going to have like a zero signal. And that will be for me the information that I've actually switched off all the stars. Now what is interesting is that obviously if I do that, the location of the black holes will correspond to the location of the stars, and so I, that will solve my problem. And what is kind of strange is that it's actually much easier to find the location of the black holes rather than the location of the stars. I'm going to go through a few equations now. That's going to be the only slides with the equation, but I want to try and give you the feeling of why this is happening, okay? So my star now is my signal x. The set of black holes will form a signal that I'm going to call h. And then this is the Fourier transform of x, and this is the Fourier transform of h. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to find an h such that this product is equal to zero, right? Because then we'll have switched off all the stars. That's the idea. So think of these, our, these are our stars. Now it's a 1D signal, so there are these sort of pulses with different amplitude. I'm trying to build an H that looks like this. Now H can have any shape, I don't care, but the only thing I need to make sure is that H is zero exactly at the location of the stars. 
because then when this happens, then this condition is satisfied. And once I find the location where h is zero, that will correspond to the location of the stars. Now h can be picked arbitrarily. You can pick the h you want. And what I do, I pick a polynomial as h, because then I need to find the coefficients of this polynomial. And the polynomial I want is the one which has zeros at the location of the Dirac's. Okay? And so since I'm after k roots, I essentially need to find k coefficients. And what is interesting is that if I write this in the frequency domain, a product is turned into a convolution. And I have the prior that h is a polynomial. So I can find h if I know x at 2k frequencies. If these 2k frequencies are evenly spaced, then this problem is actually linear. Okay, quite surprisingly, this problem is linear. So once I found this uh, Fourier transfer, uh, once I have this, I find h. So I find my polynomial, ht, and the roots of the polynomial will tell me the location of the stars. Okay. So I've apparently kind of solved the problem, right? Okay, if I know uh, this, then I find h and I find the location of the stars. The problem is that I do not have access to this uh, information. Remember, the only thing we see are pixels. Okay, so how am I going to get this information from the pixels? And here is where I'm going to use that uh, previous slides. So remember, this is our real world uh, signal, but what we see are only these uh, samples. Okay, so this is where we operate. And uh, what I would like to find is the Fourier transform of x at a few frequencies. So since I have only these samples I can play with, maybe the simplest thing that I would do is, okay, let me take the sum of all these values, okay? So this will give me one number, right? I mean, that's a simple exercise. Take all your pixels of your image and sum all of them, okay? That will give you a number. Now the question is, can I relate this number to some information of my x? Because this is really what I'm after. And now what is interesting is that because this inner product is, is linear, if I take the sum here, is equivalent to take a sum of all these shifted version of this distortion. So it's like summing all these functions together. When I sum all of them together, I get a new function which might look like this. In fact, what happens in practice is that this is normally a constant function, okay? And now this number here corresponds to the inner product between x and this new function. And if this function is the constant function, then this corresponds exactly to the Fourier transform of x at zero frequency, the DC term. So I found some Fourier information. So we are on the, you know, we are getting somewhere. So we like this trick. So now what I'm going to do is to say, all right, rather than summing all these uh, pixels, let me take a weighted sum of these pixels. Okay, so let me add weights here, whatever they are. And so as a consequence of that, I get a new number b now. And uh, when I look at the distortion, what I have is that I'm now taking the sum of these uh, functions, but it's a weighted sum, right? These weights depend on these c's that I've picked here. So when I sum all these functions, now I get uh, something else. Okay, something that looks like this. But then I can say straight away, okay, this number b corresponds to the inner product between x and this new function. Okay, so now, I understand the trick because remember, we are trying to find the Fourier transform of x at some fixed frequencies. Now, if I fix one frequency, that information is provided by the inner product between x and an everlasting sine wave, which oscillates at that frequency. Okay, that inner product will give me the Fourier transform. And so I know the trick now. What I have to do, I have to pick these coefficients here so that the sum that I have here is not this arbitrary function but it's an everlasting sine wave. If I do that, the number I obtain here is exactly the inner product between x and this sine wave, so it's exactly the Fourier transform of x at that specific frequency. And then I change the coefficients here so that I'm going to get a different sine wave, something that oscillates at a different frequency, and so I get a new number, and that corresponds exactly to x at this new frequency. Okay? And in this way, I've solved my problem. But there is still a catch here, right? And the catch is, can I actually do that, right? I mean, I'm saying, okay, let's find these coefficients such that I get this function here, all right? Is that possible or not, right? So essentially, what I'm trying to understand is whether I can satisfy this equality. Phi is uh, this uh, distortion, which is remembered due to our acquisition device. 
and I'm trying to understand whether I can combine shifted version of the acquisition device with the right coefficients so that I get this everlasting sine wave. And so by using now variations of the wave rate theory, we can provide two types of answers. Answer number one is if you allow us to design the acquisition device so that we can design the distortion, we can design this function, then we can satisfy this equality exactly. And so we can give you the Fourier information you want. If we are given an acquisition device or so someone gives us a camera and says, oh, these are the pixels I found, then given the phi of that camera, we find the coefficient c which satisfy as, as closely as possible this equality. Okay, so in both cases, we can find, let's say, the best possible c to extract the information we want from the signal. Okay, so let's put all this together now so that we can start seeing some applications. Remember, we have our signal here. We acquired it in some way, and this was giving us the pixels. And then here is where DSP starts, as I said before. So we, what we do is a combination, linear combination of these pixels. But it's an informed combination with these right coefficients. And so this gives us the information, the Fourier transform of this signal at specific frequencies. And I'd like to insist on the fact that uh, in this context, we are not only, as it used to be in the past, uh, at the receiving end of the data. So in the past, signal processing people get the data and try to do the best out of it. We also have a knowledge to tell people who design these devices how to do that, okay? To tell them, look, if you want to get the most out of this signal, design this device in this way. And that's a kind of a paradigm change because signal processing is not only receiving the data, but is also now suggesting how to acquire the data in the most effective way. And once we've done that, then we use the trick I mentioned before. We try to find the H that remove the essential information from the signal, okay? Because once you remove the essential information of the signal, this product is close to zero. And then once we've removed it, then we know where the essential information was and we can reconstruct the, the signal. This approach is again quite unconventional. When people look at sparsity, they try and do it in a very different way. They do not remove the essential information, whereas we do that. And uh, this approach has several advantages. It's more general, but actually also lead to fast algorithms. So let me try and show this now in practice so that uh, you know, we can uh, you know, get a better feeling of what's going on. So first of all, I'm going to show you some simulated data. Okay, so here I'm simulating the acquisition, and I'm also putting myself in a very favorable situation. But I'm doing that to give you a feeling of the potential of this approach. So what you're going to see here is a video, okay? That's the observed ground truth video. And what you'll see here is our estimated video. So what we managed to reconstruct with our method. And uh, what we have access to is the first frame of this video. It's a bit like saying we have a very good camera which takes the first frame with very high quality. And then we have a very bad camera here which has an extremely low resolution. So for all the remaining frames, we are going to see only 49 pixels. And yet, using the methods I mentioned before, we combine these 49 pixels with this side information, use the method before, extract the essential information, and reconstruct the signal exactly. So let me show that to you with a video here. Okay, so you see that's the information we have. This is what we reconstruct. This is the ground truth video. Okay. Look at the extremely you know, small amount of information we have access to, but since the essential information is extremely sparse, all this is enough to get the perfect reconstruction. Okay, so that's uh, simulated data, all right, and again, it's a little bit of a fireable situation, but I think that kind of provides a compelling example on, on what we can achieve, right? So now let me get real now, okay? Let me start with uh, uh, this application in the neuroscience. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Simon Schulz, who is a neuroscientist in the bioengineering department, and Yono Nativia, who is a PhD student of mine. Now, neuroscientists trying to understand the brain, apparently, and uh, 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 the elementary building block in the brain is a neuron, okay? And uh, the neuron does something very simple. The neuron produces pulses from time to time. These are called action potentials. 
And according to the timing of these pulses, the frequency or whatever, I don't know exactly, but these are communicated to other neurons and then these other neurons start firing their own uh, pulses. And through this uh, mechanism, uh, the brain, you know, processes information and we can see, talk, move, etc. Okay? So I know nothing about neuroscience, but I can definitely say that the brain understands sparsity extremely well, right? I wish we could do such sparse coding, you know, in any other signal processing uh, application because we would be fantastic, right? So now to understand the brain, what neuroscientists do, they monitor the activity, for example, using microscopes as shown here, and, uh, and they monitor typically in vivo the brain for a certain uh, time. So if we had a video here, okay, if you look at one of these spots, this would be a neuron, and then what you would see is that when the neuron is active, that spot gets brighter and gradually gets darker, and then gets brighter again and darker, and so on. So if I now sketch the evolution in time of this brightness level of one pixel, then I'm going to get a signal like this, okay? This is, ground, uh, this is real data, okay? And so you can see these are examples of, of uh, pulses, but you can see, you can sense that there is a lot of noise here. So one fundamental issue is to be able to find these uh, 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 pulses, okay? So to detect them correctly. But then the other issue is that this data has a very low resolution in time. In this specific instance, this, uh, uh, the frequency, the sampling frequency here is seven hertz. So we need to find the action potential, but also we want to increase the resolution uh, of this data so that we can find the activation time with higher accuracy. But this is really the type of data we like. It's a sparse type of data because the essential information is the location of these pulses. It's really as in the case of the stars, if you think of that. And so what we do is this trick of annihilating, removing the pulses. And by doing that, we understand where they are. The good thing is that Simon provided us ground truth data. So we know where the actual action potentials are here with high resolution. And so we can compare the performance of our method against ground truth. And so the red lines are what we retrieve and the blue lines are the ground truth spikes. And uh, if we compare the performance of our algorithm against state-of-the-art methods, we actually outperform state-of-the-art methods by a large margin. Not only, on top of that, we can operate real time on 80 such streams simultaneously. And finally, we can increase the resolution with our method by factor three. So it's a little bit like uh, we are providing data as if it was acquired by a microscope operating at 21 hertz rather than seven hertz. So that's one of the few cases in life in which we are in a win-win-win situation. <laughs> okay, let me move on. Let me look at another application here, uh, which is the problem of uh, estimating the temperature of a room. Okay, let's assume we want to see the temperature of this room here, and we want to see how it changes over time. And uh, uh, we have some sensors, okay, distributed in the room, which sense the temperature over time. And so this circle would be our uh, sensors. And out of this reading, we want to estimate the temperature of the entire room here. And uh, uh, again, here we have ground truth data. Okay, so what you are seeing here is a region, okay, there is a temperature field here, and these dots are our sensors. So here is where we get the measurements. And here you can see the measurements over time of two different sensors. Let me show you a video to show how this temperature changes over time. And that's also a way to check uh, your eyesight. Okay, let's see whether you can spot, there will be a change here at a certain point. Okay, if you have good eyes, you can see it. You know, but I cannot see anything, okay? Right, so there is something happening, but personally, I cannot see anything, right? So I gave this art problem to solve to a student of mine, uh, uh, John Murray Bruce, and asked him, John, can you retrieve the temperature fields, right? Now, John is a bright guy and said, okay, let me look at this. Let me use this technique of annihilation. Let me use my uh, uh, good uh, uh, um, test function, which happens to be an analytic function, and this is what he estimates. Okay, so this is what's happening according to uh, uh, John. Right now, the fact that John is able to come up with this out of that data, I think it's remarkable in itself, right? Because I couldn't see anything, right? But uh, I think it's even more remarkable when we compare his estimation with the ground truth data, which we have access to. And so uh, on this side here is the ground truth data, and this is what uh, uh, John estimated. 
I think is not bad, in particular if you think of the incredibly small amount of information we had access to. But I still think that the highlight, at least for me, of this type of work happened when, uh, with the former students of mine, Loic Babulas, we made it into the news. Hello and welcome back to our video roundup. I'm Mike Marshall and I'm going to be taking you through some of our best videos this week. First of all, a lot of you will be taking uh, photos over the holiday season and if you don't have a top of the range camera, help is on the way. Mathematicians at Imperial College in London have created a new method to sharpen up blurry images. Here's a photo of the moon, which they took with a standard SLR camera. When enlarged, it becomes very blurred. With the camera mounted on a tripod, they captured a series of images of the moon every three seconds. Then, they took 60 of these images and applied their technique. The different images can then be superimposed and algorithms are applied to produce a sharpened up image. The new method lines up the original snaps more accurately, producing sharper results. It should also be possible to make it fast enough to put into digital cameras. If there is something that puzzled me about this, uh, uh, you know, uh, thing for many years, is the fact that Loic and myself were downgraded to mathematicians. <laughs> it's something that, that, that has really puzzled me. I mean, I didn't, stu didn't study maths at the grad school. I thought it was too easy. I wanted to do something challenging like engineering. <laughs> and then it turns out, as soon as we do something funny, we are not engineers, we are mathematicians, <laughs> right? So that puzzled me a lot. But I have to say that I think there is also a reason why this is happening. I think that signal processing is not highly considered in, in this country, to be honest. I don't think it is treated as a science, or if you want, a computational science. And I think this is why each time we do something, let's say, a little bit unusual, it cannot be us, must be some scientist uh, somewhere else. And I think as a community, we need to try and correct that, because uh, otherwise, as a community, we'll all pay a price for it. OK, now let me change topic. And as I said, I will be a little bit faster now. But again, I want to give you an idea of when we are given a different problem, the way we approach it, and we use always these same type of guidelines. So. Uh, here, what I'm going to look at are these multi-camera systems, uh, which take you know, videos from different viewing positions. And obviously, multi-camera systems are used for many uh, applications. You know, security is obviously a typical example. But uh, the type of application that interests me more is uh, the one in which you have a multi-camera system recording, for example, an event, like a sport event. So you have many cameras, let's say, uh, 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 pointing to the pitch of a football, uh, to a football pitch. And then what we want to do is, given these uh, several cameras, we want to be able to render novel views. So imagine you are a user, you're watching your match, and then all of a sudden, you want to change the viewing positions. And for example, put yourself behind the goal and have the same uh, you know, view that the goalkeeper would have, right? This problem is called image-based rendering. And the idea, as I said, is that if you have a few images taken at different positions, for example, you want to get uh, 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 new views. OK, so you want to create arbitrary new images at the different position. The difficulty of this problem is that, first of all, you want to render this novel view, but they must be photorealistic, because you want to render a view that looks like a real image or a real video sequence. And the other issue is that, obviously, if you want to apply this on uh, sport events and things like this, then you need to operate real time. And everything has to be automatic. There is no time for human intervention. And, uh, and this makes the problem, obviously, much harder. So how do, how do we attack these problems? OK, now you understand our way of thinking. So the first thing we do, we look at the data, and then we try and find these elementary building blocks I mentioned before. So let's look at the data for this case. So here is uh, one example. There are two objects here. And then I have the cameras moving along a line. So it's a bit like saying I take a picture, then I move, take another picture, I move, take another picture, and so on. If I put all the images together, this is the type of data I obtain. So it's quite structured, right? We get this sort of, uh, let's say, tubes. OK, and each tube is related to a different object. Now, things change if I change the location of the cameras. So if I put the cameras in a circle like here, then I get a much more complicated data. And so my first conclusion is that I prefer this type of data to this one here. This is known as epi. OK, so uh, epi volume. So I like this type of data. So the first thing I'm going to do is, if the cameras are moving along an arbitrary trajectory, like here, I'm going to approximate this trajectory with a piecewise linear approximation. So I'm going to have these straight lines. And I'm going to assume that the cameras are along these straight lines. Because then, 
on each of these straight lines, what I see is something that would look, uh, uh, sorry, oops, that would look like uh, this object here, okay? If there is something that my PhD students don't lack is sense of humor, right? So these are synthesized things, and uh, we have uh, Mona Lisa uh, slightly, you know, changed, right? We presented this at the conference. I had to present it, but anyway. <laughs> so, so that's the first thing we would do, right? So we do this sort of piecewise linear approximation. Then on each of these lines, we have this type of epistructure, okay? So th this is the data we have. And then we want to separate all these tubes, okay? So we developed an algorithm to do that, and we call it a layer extraction algorithm. And so these are the kind of uh, tubes, if you want, that we get. And uh, note that if I sum all of them together, I get my complicated data back, okay? And then if I want, on each of them, I can apply a wavelet transform on each of these tubes independently, and that will give me a very sparse representation of this data. So that's the way we decompose our data. We have an arbitrary trajectory of the camera. We do this piecewise linear approximation. On each of these pieces, we do this layer extraction, and then we do this wavelet transfer and we get sparsity. So here are the building blocks and sparsity. So this is what we want. And once we've achieved that, then we can do many things. One obvious uh, conclusion, uh, one obvious application is compression. And uh, without showing you too, uh, too much about it, so these are the algorithms, the performance of our algorithm uh, 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 using this method. And this is the standard uh, compression algorithm for this type of data. Uh, uh, this is related to standardization committee, so there are a lot of uh, millions involved. The other curve is the result of one PhD uh, thesis, so I think we use the taxpayers' money very effectively, okay? Uh, but also, I think uh, uh, what we want to achieve is the image-based rendering I mentioned before, so let me show you how we obtain that using this approach. Uh, uh, so these are the images I have access to in this case, so it's a bit like I have my camera, I take a picture, I move, take another picture, and so on, and then I go down and take another picture, and so on. So I'm moving the camera on a plane. And then based on this set of images, then we create this video where we render many more images. So we move around, and then we can pan in and pan out. Let me show you this video, which is due to James Person. And remember, everything is automatic and almost real time. Okay, stay tuned with this uh, research area because I think there will be many more things happening in this domain. Uh, what's happening now is that uh, everything is now collapsing into a single device. So now, first of all, there are cameras like this one here, which are called planoptic cameras, which are able to take all these images with a single snapshot. So if you take a single picture, then what this camera will give you is some type of data that will look like this one uh, here. Um, so it's a bit like saying the camera has many small cameras inside, okay? But then also we know that now we have many uh, active sensing devices that allow us to uh, sense depth. Kinect is the typical example everybody's familiar with. Now what's happening is that all these technologies collapsing into a single device, which will normally be either your tablets or your mobile phone. And then when you have all these data into a single device, then there are many new things you can do from 3D gesture recognition to 3D object recognition, image-based rendering, and so on and so forth. However, if you want to collapse everything in such a small device, which is battery powered, then this needs to be done extremely efficiently. So you really want to acquire only the essential information because there is no room for errors, right? Everything is in a small device. And so sparse signal processing, sparse uh, sampling, will be of central importance in this uh, uh, area, and uh, I hope that we'll produce surprise soon, but uh, at this stage we, uh, you know, just working on that. Okay, I'm really approaching the end of this uh, talk, but I think I could not finish it without talking about something everybody talks about nowadays, and I'm sure you know already what I'm thinking about. What I'm thinking is about this topic, which is called big signals. So it's not big data, okay, it's big signals. Why is that? Why is big signals rather than big data? Well, 90% of the data exchange on internet is non-textual. Okay, so it's either video or images or audio, mostly video. So if you want to do anything interesting in this domain, 
then you need to understand the signals which are exchanged. You cannot treat them as abstract data, whatever that means. You need to understand the modality of the signals, the phenomena which are acquired and transmitted. And this is why I like to call it big signals rather than uh, big data. But let me also show another thing. So here there is an hypothetical social network, all right? And uh, then it's not by chance, but these two guys here are not really friends, right? They are really far away. However, they have the same uh, images, okay, here. So if you want, they're storing the same type of data. So if I think of connections, there is a layer of connection here, which is a social network or a social graph. But then I can also design, if I want, a data-driven connection, okay? And then in the data-driven graph, these two guys will be much closer, okay? So there is some information in that, there is something in that, right? We don't know why these two guys have the same data. Maybe that's just because they're attending the same event. They are two perfectly unknown uh, uh, persons and they are watching, you know, this, attending the same event and taking pictures and uploading pictures. And so they are uploading more or less the same pictures. But there also might be another reason. Uh, maybe they have the same interests, right? So they collect pictures of the same sites, uh, maybe pictures of the same painters, and so on and so forth. And uh, if that's the case, then we can anticipate from the data that these two guys are going to become probably friends later on. And so this is what really interests me, is the dynamic and the interplay between these two layers of networks. There is a social type of connection and network and a data-driven network. And obviously the knowledge of one is going to tell us something about the other and so on and help us to anticipate how things are going to evolve. We have not solved this problem, obviously, but again, now you understand how we're trying to attack this type of problem. So there are two things we're trying to do, finding elementary building blocks in which we can decompose this complicated structure, and uh, the other thing is sparsity. Or if you want, we want to find a way to summarize all the information here, okay, in an effective uh, way. So we are working on that uh, with uh, my students, Madeleine Kotsagionidis, and uh, our conjecture is the following. When you have friends, they, friend, they tend to cluster together, right? So they have uh, many connections. And then there is another group of friends, they also have many uh, connections. And then maybe these two clusters are loosely connected, right? And so the first thing we want to do is to separate each cluster. So treat it as one of our elementary building block. But then among all possible clusters, those that we like are clusters like the one shown here, where there is this kind of circular type of friendship. And why we like this, ty this type of clusters? That's because if we model this connection using a matrix, the matrix is circulant. And in signal processing, we like circulant matrices. They are related to convolutions and many other things. Now, under these assumptions, then we are actually generally able to reduce the size of this uh, 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 network and just to preserve the fundamental nodes. And simultaneously, we can reduce the amount of data which is stored at each node so that we can get a compact description of this uh, 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 cluster, okay? Uh, that's preliminary work, but uh, I kind of like this uh, topic here because it's obviously very multidisciplinary. There are obviously elements of stats and maths in here, but there is also a lot of computer science. But if you think of it, all the topics that I've covered were really multidisciplinary. I think the connection with applied mathematics is the most evident one, but there was also connection with physics when you think of the temperature fields and with hardware design and obviously with uh, 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 experts in other fields like neuroscience, etc. What was common to all these domains was that signal processing was center stage and was really the glue that was keeping everything uh, together. So next time you face a new problem, don't forget this important fact. Thank you very much. I'm going to invite a small number of questions to uh, the lecturer tonight. Any questions? I didn't expect that. Okay, all right. Ah, <laughs> uh -huh. well, I, 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 just, I, Tom. Tom, you know that there is a dinner after, right? Yes. <laughs> Less familiar with brain patterns, but again, 
there are spikes there and you, you, you're looking for spikes. So you've got a bit of prior knowledge. Let's take a random example that you won't know. In fact, nobody knows. Mars quakes, um, chosen at random. Um, we don't know what we're looking for and we're trying to get your, uh, all of the, the power of your techniques to apply to something that we don't know the other side. Is it still going to hold together? So, uh, I mean, you get sparsity when you have some understanding of the model, right? Uh, and so my, you know, short answer is that you should learn the model while sampling. So you start acquiring in a very traditional way, and then you start getting some understanding of the essential, let's say, structure of the data you are trying to collect, and then you can optimize your sampling process. I think if you assume you know nothing, right? I mean, if you are something random Gaussian noise, I don't think I can help you, right, to be honest, right? <laughs> and probably I don't want, right? Well, so, so, but, but, uh, but yeah, no, no, absolutely, better. right. But, but if I have no knowledge whatsoever, uh, I cannot, you know, uh, the technique is there, but I need to acquire some, some understanding of, you know, what, what is the, what are the key, uh, properties of the data, you, of the sigma you're trying to so acquire. So Occam's razor is really more like a shaving process where you have to... Uh, yes, if you want, yes. Yes. Concentrate on the... Uh, we'll ask Occam. <laughs> Let's ask him his opinion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? There's a question. Oh, I wonder whether you used uh, any other wavelet apart from half wavelet. Yeah, so I have to be honest, the, the, uh, yes, we did actually, okay. Now, the thing I have to say is that I used, I started with the wavelets because for us, what is really important is not necessarily the wavelet transform itself, but it's all the mathematical framework that came with the wavelet. And this is really what we used mostly. It's not that we use uh, a wavelet, I mean, uh, a w specific wavelet transform. Um, yeah, okay. Okay, one last question. What is the connection between? <laughs> so, the, sorry, the question is the difference between sparse coding and unsupervised, unsupervised learning. learning. And supervised learning. So, yeah. what what do you think sparse coding is? Because you know, people use this term to mean many many things. All right. So, I cannot answer a question. <laughs> so. Yeah, what, what, what do you mean by sparse coding in this context? I think in this particular case, I, I will in, interrupt and suggest that you have a conversation a bit offline. Uh, offline. Okay, yeah. yes. So, uh, because there is, in fact, dinner afterwards <laughs> uh, for those who are invited, if they don't <laughs> come or not, uh, uh, I would now like to invite Professor Martin Vetterli from EPFL to give a vote of thanks. Martin. Thank you very much. Okay, I, it was just announced that I was the bad news between now and the dinner, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm sorry about this, but it's only going to be equations, so don't worry. <laughs> All right, so who is this fellow, uh, Pierluigi Dragotti? So we just missed his birthday by a few days, I noticed. Um, I noticed today, so it was really too late. Uh, so the chairman al already introduced his uh, curriculum. He's from southern Italy, it's very important. Um, he, he graduated from EPFL. I'm not exactly sure what you meant when you said he tasted North Americans and he came to EPFL. Uh, because in Europe, a lot of people think EPFL is like uh, an island of American uh, academia. So maybe it's that mix, I'm not sure. Anyway, he graduated uh, with a PhD about uh, 13 years ago. We managed to keep him for a few months as a senior researcher before you stole uh, him from us. And ever, ever after, he was, as we say in Switzerland, off to the empire. <laughs> so, okay, now I was trying to figure out what was the obsession of Pierluigi of, uh, you know, the super resolution, taking pictures of the moon and so on. 
and finally we, we figured it out, okay? So he published a paper, actually it's his most cited paper. I'm very envious because I, it's not even a paper we did together. He did this before he came to EPFL. And this is, you know, the standard CV in uh, IEEE transactional remote sensing. And if you're close enough, you can see there is really a resolution problem on your, on your <laughs> picture, right? Okay, so ever after, he must have been so frustrated, he said, I'm going to fix that problem. <laughs> okay, but meanwhile, he had a good time at EPFL. I think that's EPFL, probably, right? Uh, but there are surprising things. You know, I didn't know you programmed in Java. This must, <laughs> maybe that was just for the sake of the picture, you know? Uh, we also applied very sophisticated uh, um, image on var warping to show that even though he was at EPFL, he really wanted to be at Stanford, right? As you can <laughs> probably recognize from the sweatshirt. Uh, but he was a great team player at EPFL at the time. Uh, we had a lot of fun having him on the team. Uh, and he wanted to leave a footprint. So he wrote a thesis called Wavelet Footprints and Frames for Signal Processing and Communication with a very nice uh, uh, footprint on the cover. Okay, and that got him the job at Imperial College. It was also a time when there was a, an interesting uh, crew of people at EPFL. So I just looked these people up just this morning uh, and, and gathered their web pages. And you can see the web pages look very different. Uh, depending on where you're a professor these days, right? So uh, this is an amazing picture, okay? This is Master Mindo in his empire at University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Uh, this is Michael Gaspar, who that's a picture from Berkeley where he was on the faculty for a while. And this is Pina Marziliano, who is uh, in Asia, right? Looks, you know, that's Singapore. So you can see very different styles. and. There is an ongoing bet about these people, and I still, you know, you know, we still have to go for that dinner, but I actually don't know who won the bet, but we'll settle this over dinner tonight. Good. Okay, you can see he, he almost fixed the problem by then. That's a <laughs> publication um, he did actually with us and uh, with Vladan, who is here in the room, a PhD student that uh, Pierre Luigi supervised. I must say very early on it was clear that Pierre Luigi would become an academic. He is a great teacher, as you could hear from the lecture. He was also a great mentor, okay? And uh, he mentored several PhD students at the time, even before he was formally himself a faculty member here at Imperial. Okay, when he came here, the first thing he did, he's, he stole the best students away from EPFL. <laughs> okay, so I think on the first team, there are three students from EPFL, right? And uh, several, uh, Loic is here, right? Famous Loic, uh, Jesse, and uh, I think there is a third one, right? Who was your first PhD okay. student? Nicolas was your first PhD student. But you'll see, we'll get back at him. I'll see on later pictures. Okay, so I think he has, he's a family man, okay? But also at the lab, I think he runs a very convivial lab, I'm, you know, very liked by his graduate students, uh, very dedicated to mentor people through the stages of, uh, it's actually the most beautiful part of the job in my view as well, and Pierre Luigi does it extremely well. Um, and then I, I thought this was, you know, there must be something Harry Potterish if you come to England, <laughs> and sure there is, so that graduation of these are actually the three EPFL students, right? Okay, with PhDs here from Imperial. And all of them are back in Switzerland, I'm pleased to say. One is at Google Research, uh, one has his own startup, and one works with me, okay? So, <laughs> okay, so this is the team. So I was being told these are your 15 graduate students, okay? I know most of them, but not all of them. And really, th the early crew was st you know, straight out of EPFL, and then it became a very international uh, team, as is, is, as is the norm in these type of research groups uh, that we tried to run. And these people uh, went all over the place. Uh, some of them became faculty members, others went to industry, others started companies, uh, or came back uh, here to, uh, to, the, to their home. Okay, the current crew is that I, I learned coming here is uh, two postdocs and uh, seven PhD students. And that's a nice team that you have to attack the next uh, stage. You're going to solve big signal. So that's good. Uh, good luck to you. Um, then I looked up, you know, the man is famous because he won one of these uh, European Research Council grants, which is considered to be the Olympic Games of uh, research in Europe. 
And it's on topics that he has presented here, so I'm not going to spend much time, but identifying sparse signals, um, finding temperature maps, uh, finding nuclear fallouts, and of course, uh, moving also to neuroscience type of topics, and of course, fixing the super resolution uh, problem, okay, which stays as one, uh, in, in some sense, very emblematic problem that is very easy to explain, has been out there for probably 30 years or plus, right? Tom Huang wrote a paper about it, I think, in the 80s. And to some extent, it's still an open problem because it's an extremely ill-posed problem, okay? But that I'm not going to discuss this uh, here. Uh, then I said, oh, the man, you know, is in the Champions League of European research. Let me go look what sort of funding he gets in England, right? And so there is good news and bad news. The good news is that the website of EPSRC is very well done. It took, it took me 27 seconds to find Pierluigi Dracotti. The bad news is that he doesn't get any money from <laughs> EPSRC, okay? Go figure. Uh, maybe there is some improvements there to be done, but meanwhile, I think he makes a good living with uh, ERC money, and uh, good luck to him. All right, people are obsessed with, um, you know, quantifying research output. I think there is not much to say, but he's one of these ri rising stars who has, you know, lots of good production papers. He's not somebody who writes extremely many papers, but he writes something, it is really good stuff, and people appreciate this in this current world of research where often quantity uh, trumps uh, quality, unfortunately. And so he has a bunch of papers here that are very well cited. And his website looks very nice. I mean, th here we see we are in England. This is, you know, not sort of the flashy US style of Urbana Champagne. It's not, you know, the Singapore style, which is, is sort of, you're not exactly sure if you're in academia or somewhere else. <laughs> I hope nobody is recording this or Pina is actually watching. <laughs> so, um, and, okay, so I go to the website. What do I see? Adam wins gold at the Commonwealth Games, okay? And Adam is in the room and Adam actually works for me. And that's the most amazing thing is that Pierluigi, you know, uh, mentors somebody who is on the Olympic team uh, at the same time as doing a PhD, and that requires really good teamwork on the part of the mentor and of the PhD student. I can tell you, Adam is a fantastic guy. He is here on this picture, Pierluigi and his academic family, and that's a gold medal of, uh, of Adam here, Schollfield, who won this gold medal at the Commonwealth. Okay. So I would like to congratulate, actually, Pierluigi and his team for the fantastic work that was accomplished. I'm very happy that everything goes so well. Thank you for your attention. Well, uh, that ends uh, this evening's proceeding, at least for some of you. But <laughs> okay. And those who are having dinner and doesn't know where to go, just follow the crowd. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>